You're watching NASA TV. Hey, good afternoon. I'm NASA's Gary Jordan. Thank you for joining us for our briefing to preview the next spacewalk scheduled for this Friday, January 20th, 2023, aboard the International Space Station. The spacewalk will be the 84th U.S. spacewalk to be conducted out of the Quest Airlock, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata and NASA astronaut Nicole Mann will be our spacewalkers. The two will be working on installing mounting platforms on the 1A and 1B power channels that are needed to install another pair of IROSA solar arrays on the space station during future spacewalks. This will be the first spacewalk for both Wakata and Mann. In this briefing, we'll discuss the state of the International Space Station and pre spacewalk preparations. We'll also walk through the detailed procedures of the January 20th spacewalk. Our briefers today include Dina Contella, Operations Integration Manager of the International Space Station Program, Chloe Maring, Flight Director for this spacewalk, and Keith Johnson, Lead Spacewalk Officer. As always, we'll first start with some initial remarks from each of our briefers before opening it up for questions. We'll be taking questions on our phone bridge as well as here in the room. If you're on the phone, please press star one to be added to our queue and to ask a question. We'll now begin with opening comments from Dina Contella. Dina. All right, thank you, Gary, and um, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, so before we get into the details of the spacewalks, which uh, of the spacewalk which our um, uh, panel here are going to go into, I did just want to talk a little bit about operations on ISS these days because we, it's been really busy. And since I was last here, um, uh, we've had a, a lot happening. I'd say um, you know, multiple vehicles coming and going, and um, and spacewalks. So I'll go into a few of those. Uh, first of all, the Northrop Grumman vehicle that launched in November. Uh, it's a cargo vehicle, NG-18. That vehicle um, did arrive at ISS. Uh, it had a successful rendezvous. It brought 8,200 pounds of cargo. Um, we're happy to get those supplies on board. Uh, if you recall, it had had one solar array that didn't deploy, but it was able to successfully rendezvous. Uh, and the crew's been busy unloading the cargo and packing it full of trash, and we're expecting um, to unberth and release it around March 1st. Um, so uh, a successful mission. And we're not anticipating any issues with its unberth or release due to the solar array. Um, and then later in November, we had a SpaceX 26 cargo mission, and so SpaceX CRS 26. It's um, also, it was extremely successful. It's already completed its 45-day mission and splashed down uh, last week. Uh, it was really heavy on the science, and um, so our scientists are extremely happy, and um, they, they got a lot of good, uh, lot of good data. Not just NASA, but all of our international partners um, had participation, and um, it, was, it was a really great mission. So just congratulations to both the Northrop Grumman and the SpaceX teams on um, successful missions. And uh, we also had um, three spacewalks that have happened since November. So we had one that was a, an installation of some struts for the uh, one Bravo channel. and. Um, this is setting us up for the IROSA EVA, so it'll be happening um, when they uh, bring up the new arrays in June. Uh, is what we're kind of think is what we're thinking for for uh, the SpaceX 28 mission, uh, and so um, we did that we did that EVA very successfully, and um, the we just have a few remaining bolts to finish on that, and we also de re deployed both of the two IROSA EVAs, uh, both of the two IROSAs that uh, came up on SpaceX 26. And um, we had over two EVAs on December 3rd and December 19th. So um, the IROSAs deployed perfectly, and uh, they're supplying power now. And so really, again, hats off to the team that has built, the, uh, has built those arrays, the Boeing and Red, Red Wire teams. And uh, they're building additional arrays, like I said, for um, probably the June time frame uh, when we'll launch the, the next set. And so um, as part of the um, spacewalks, the we typically have four spacesuits on board, and uh, in this case, back last year, if you remember, we had had an incident with water that had entered into uh, the helmet of one of our crew members in March. And so we brought down one of the four spacesuits over the summer. We took a look at that, and as I reported in November, 
the um, you know the team has worked through uh, the investigation and uh, we're able to continue EVAs, which of course we did three. Um, but that had only left us with three spacesuits on board. And we did have another issue that came up uh, with one of the um, fan pump separator units in, in one of the spacesuits. So for this last series of EVAs, we went into that with only two spacesuits, so uh, down some redundancy. Uh, but in December, the crew and the team changed out the uh, fan pump separator, and we're now back up to three of our four spacesuits, and SpaceX 27 uh, will bring up another spacesuit, will bring us up to the full complement. And the, the spacewalks that happened in December were really successful, um, and in fact, we also had had an issue with our 1B power channel where it was um, intermittently tripping off, and so we had taken it out of um, out of use, out of service. So the one uh, one B, one B, so basically one eighth of our power, um, was down for a period of time. But during one of the spacewalks, we unplugged a power cable, and that took the intermittent tripping uh, out of the equation. It isolated the issue that we had. And so, uh, again, we, we were able to add that last minute to, the, to uh, one of the spacewalks, and it ended up um, highly successful. So I'm really happy with the results there. And so um, in the last couple of months, also, the Russians had several EVAs planned, and we've had a couple of them postponed. So um, the, they, first, they had an issue with um, uh, some of the, the Orlan spacesuit components. Um, but they fixed that. They were able to change those components out. But then when they started the next spacewalk, uh, that's when we had the Soyuz coolant leak. And so that one was also postponed. And the, the Rus our Russian colleagues are working on their, their forward plans for spacewalks at this point and, and when the next one will be. And so um, relative to the, to the Soyuz coolant leak, uh, there was a dedicated press conference on this last week with Joel Montalbano, our program manager, and with Sergey Krikalev, who's the human spaceflight executive director at Roscosmos. And so I don't want to turn this into a, a Soyuz press conference, but I uh, just wanted to give an update uh, on that, which, uh, so as you recall what they said last week, instead of bringing home um, uh, Sergey, Dmitri, and Frank in that Soyuz where we had the coolant leak, um, instead, what we're going to do is Roscosmos is planning to launch a, a, uh, an empty vehicle on February 20th, Baikonur time, and uh, that vehicle will dock autonomously to ISS, and then that will be the new return vehicle uh, for, again, Sergey, Dmitri, and Frank. Um, and then the vehicle that's currently on, on orbit will come, ho will basically be uh, landed autonomously in Kazakhstan, so uh, that vehicle is taken out of the equation. Uh, the update I wanted to share is that uh, last week, Joel and Sergey had mentioned that we were looking at SpaceX Dragon as potential for, um, for a rescue vehicle between now and February 20th in case we had a contingency evacuation that was necessary. And so we looked at that and we did decide that that is a good plan. Um, we are planning to just move Frank Rubio's seat liner over from the Soyuz uh, tomorrow, actually, over into the Dragon. And we think that that'll take out uh, some of the heat load that's in the in the Soyuz spacecraft uh, and will uh, help the overall uh, posture for us. And so the team has come up with a really good plan to, um, to uh, provide this as just as an evacuation type of contingency. And we are not planning to bring Frank home down uh, bring Frank home down in this particular vehicle in the in the Dragon. So again, the the plan is for Frank and Dimitri and uh, Sergey to stay on board for several more months until they come home, uh, probably in late September. Uh, we're looking at uh, the exact uh, timing of that, but at this point, that would be when the vehicle would be planned to come home. So that's the update on on that, and um, I'll just say the rest of the flight program because we're trying to work around the February twentieth. Uh, launch date for the Soyuz. Uh, we're still working on the exact dates, but we're, we're shooting for Crew 6 to launch in mid to late February, and then Crew 5 would come home uh, sometime uh, a few days after that, uh, during, after a direct handover. Uh, we've got a progress vehicle, and we've got, um, uh, that'll, that will launch in February timeframe, and then we'll have probably in the March timeframe, SpaceX 27, uh, that's a cargo mission, and then after that we'll have a Northrop Grumman mission, NG-19. 
So it, it's a really busy time, and um, I just wanted to give you a quick update, but the, again, I'd like to refocus us on the EVA, uh, and um, the EVA is happening on Friday, and as Gary mentioned, the crew are uh, Koichi Wakata and Nicole Mann. Uh, they're going to be our rookie spacewalkers. Um, but Koichi has a lot of space experience, and I just wanted to brag on him for a moment that um, he surpassed his 400th day in space in late November. Uh, he's accumulated this over multiple missions, but um, he's really, um, really got a lot, uh, a lot of history here. And both he and Nicole have done an outstanding job on orbit, and they're well trained and ready to go for this, uh, for this spacewalk. So, uh, looking forward to that. Yeah, our overall objectives, uh, and these guys will go into a little bit more detail, but uh, again, we're trying to, to set up a frame, uh, some struts that will be used for future IROSA installation, uh, and that's kind of the most of the, of the spacewalk. Uh, we're finishing the tightening of the bolts on, some, on a previous set of struts that we had installed, uh, and we're also installing a cable that would um, sort of allow us, to, would allow us to route power around if a, if a particular box, uh, elect electrical box failed on the truss. Uh, so this gives us kind of an autonomous way to route power, and so that's a really important cable for us. And then there's a few get-aheads, and, and uh, maybe Keith will go into this, but um, it's routing additional cables to prepare for other EVAs, uh, and also we have um, a robotic microconical tool that we're going to go retrieve and bring back for refurbishment as well. Again, those are just if we have time, though. So the, the main focus is really on the struts. But that's all I had in terms of opening remarks. And so at this point, what I'm going to do is hand it off to Chloe, who is our lead flight director. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here today and for those of you online listening. So again, Nicole and Koichi, they are our spacewalkers. We have Koichi as EV-1 and Nicole as EV-2, and it is their first EVAs. We have a lot of confidence in them. They have been prepping and practicing and studying remarkably. We've been getting a lot of questions, a lot of comments from them, so we know that they're well prepared. Um, as far as training on the mod kit, they've also been able to do this in the pool together. It was back in August of 2022. Um, and prior to that, we do have some other specific trainers uh, in our buildings and facilities here that they've been able to practice on. Like I said, the prep on board's been going really well. They've been very attentive. We've had uh, two, pre uh, two uh, conferences with them so far, and we have one more coming up just to hash out any of the last minute details. So the mod kits, um, these are required in order to install the IROSAs or the ISS rollout solar arrays. Um, and ISS is just a really great platform to use these solar arrays, um, not only to get the power on board for our payloads, but also to use them as um, future tech demos on other vehicles such as Gateway or maybe another deep space uh, type mission. So what they'll be doing is, if I can go ahead and get um, picture six, we can take a look at what it looks like. Um, so this is our current, well, almost current picture of station. We haven't had a vehicle depart to, just, to be able to see our three alpha and four alpha uh, IROSA arrays on there. But we currently have four IROSAs on board. They're supplying about nine kilowatts of power, um, which is going towards a lot of payloads and science. Uh, we have the mod kit. Um, assembled on one Bravo. We have a little bit of work we need to do on that in order for it to be able to receive an IROSA. Um, and we're going to be going out on one Alpha. So we'll be out on the uh, S4 to S6 trusses. Um, so with that, uh, the nice thing with these mod kits is um, we're not constrained uh, regarding when we need to be out the door, when we need to start working on this. So this is just getting the platform ready. So we have a, a heavy timeline with a lot of work going on, um, but we're not constrained to eclipses and insulation, so when the sun rises and sun sets. So we can get out the door. We got some flexibility working around our, our timeline and our plan. Um, so what we're going to be doing, as far as station is concerned, to be getting ready for the uh, EVA is we are going to park our sarges or our solar, um, I'm sorry, our solar array rotary joints, and uh, we will have to uh, park two of our beta gimbal assemblies, our BGAs, in order to allow the crew to get out there to put these mod kits on board. Um, we've got a couple power downs we need to put in place. We'll get that done ahead of time. Um, and like I said, the, um, or like Dina said, the IROSAs are currently not on board. They'll be coming up at a later date, but this is really to get ourselves set up to receive these, ro these uh, solar rays. So I'm going to hand it over to Keith to talk more of the details. Um, but again, what we're going to have is Koichi head out towards uh, the one Bravo array, which is at the S6. He's going to start work there while we get uh, Duke at the one Alpha, and she's going to start setting up our one Alpha mod kit, and uh, we'll see where the timeline takes us. So, Keith, if you want to talk the details, hand it over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, 
Uh, it's always a pleasure when we get to send out rookie crew members like we get to on this on this particular spacewalk. But it's especially good because it's all of Crew 5 now will have EVA experience, which I, I think that's um, a remarkable accomplishment because generally we have a, a pair of crew members that do most of the spacewalks. But in this case, we're going to spread the wealth across um, all of them and, and get Koichi a chance to get out the door. So that's, that's invigorating. Um, we also have a, a rookie flight director because this will be her first EVA. Um, but um, the good news with that is that I have done so many that I make up for all of them. Um, and I'm the crusty old EVA officer. Uh, this is our uh, sixth mod kit. And the, the great thing about these EVAs is a, it's a lot like an erector set. Um, we get to drive a lot of bolts, put linkages together. Um, it, it, all goes together so beautifully, it's fun, and it gives a chance for the crew to go out and drive a lot of bolts uh, like uh, construction engineers, so it's a lot of fun. Um, again, they, they did get a chance to, to practice this in the pool out at the MBL, which is a, a great platform for uh, learning how to do all the activities where they need to translate, how they need to set up their work sites, what it takes to drive the bolts. This is also an awesome EVA for teamwork, because you'll never see two people work together more carefully and concisely. Um, they start out separated. Um, as Chloe mentioned, um, Koichi heads out uh, to, to uh, S6 to start on the 1B truss. That's the one where we left the collar bolts uh, not driven. So currently, that particular uh, mod kit will not accept an IROSA. Um, and then, in the meantime, um, Nicole starts building what we call the upper triangle, and that's the part of the truss that's going to get, or part of the uh, the mod kit that gets installed first on the mass canister. Um, uh, when that's ready to go and it's built, Koichi will come back inboard and join Nicole, and the two of them will start the assembly process together. Um, so I have a video to show that's our um, VR lab uh, animation with um, some narration over top of it. If you'd like to show that now. U.S. EVA-84 starts with EV-1 Koichi Wakata with the red stripes on his suit coming out the hatch first. EV-2, Nicole Mann, will be handing out a bag that has cables in it and a large bag that has the mod kit struts in it. Koichi will put the cable bag onto his body restraint tether and be prepared to hand the strut bag to Nicole as she comes out of the hatch. Once they're in position, Koichi will start his translation up the Ceta spur to get to the front face of the International Space Station to start his translation out toward the starboard part. He'll stop and attach his safety tether and Nicole's safety tether as their anchor point and then continue on out the starboard truss. Along the way, Koichi will stop and drop off his cable bag. Once that's in position, he'll continue translating starboard. As he moves along the truss, he'll stop and he'll put down what we call a green hook, which allows him to go the rest of the way Nicole will close the thermal cover. She'll have the MMOD strut bag on her body restraint tether and follow the same path that Koichi did. Nicole Mann will follow Koichi's translation path as she gets to the solar ray alpha rotary joint and gets to the 1A work site. She'll stow the strut bag and restrain it in position. Once that's done, she'll make her way back to the crew and equipment translation aid attached to the mobile, mobile transporter and retrieve the articulating portable foot restraint with an extender. Once she has that attached to her body restraint tether, she'll make her way outboard towards the starboard end and her work site at the one alpha beta gimbal assembly. She'll install this foot restraint and position it for the work she's going to do shortly. Nicole will collect 
part of what we refer to as the upper triangle, which is uh, sections of truss that are part of the mod kit assembly. This will become uh, the beginning backbone of the entire mod kit. These struts are put into position and bolted together. While Nicole is working on that, Koichi heads out to the 1B beta gimbal assembly and tightens two collar bolts on the right hand side and left hand side of the 1 Bravo mod kit. Koichi will translate back inboard and join Nicole at the 1A worksite. Nicole will translate over to the articulating portable foot restraint and ingress. Koichi positions the upper triangle and hands that up to Nicole. Nicole takes the upper triangle and drives four bolts to attach it to the beta gimbal assembly. Koichi hands up the lower strut and the mid strut and then translates to get into position to install them. Both crew members work together to drive the bolts on the right lower strut and secure it in place. Once the lower strut's installed, Koichi repositions to install the mid strut. Again, the two crew members work together to get the right mid strut in place and drive the bolts which hold it. Once the right struts are in place, Koichi goes back to the strut bag and hands up the mid strut and the lower strut to Nicole. Nicole ingresses the foot restraint and the two crew members work together to install the left hand lower strut. Once that's in place, they work together yet again to install the mid strut. Once all the struts have been put in place, they drive the final collar bolts which rigidize the whole system in place. They put the multi-layer insulation back in place to cover up all of the metal components. Koichi translates over to the right hand mid strut and does the same collar bolts on that side. Once the collar bolts have been driven in place, Nicole can egress the foot restraint and start routing the IROSA cables. These cables will be installed once the IROSA flies up, the summer of 2023. Koichi then routes the cables on the right hand side, and that completes the installation of the mod kit. The crew will then translate back and stow the articulating portable foot restraint. Turn the strut bag to the airlock. In the meantime, Nicole picks up a cable, which is part of the DC to DC converter unit jumper. She'll install a cable at two different locations on the strut, and then make her way back to the airlock. Both crew members will meet back at the airlock, open up the thermal cover, 
they'll stow the bags that they'd taken out with them into the airlock. Nicole will lead back inside, and Koichi will follow. They'll close the thermal cover, and then the hatch inside, and that will end USCBA 84. Okay, um, so again, you can see how the, the construction is going to go for this particular EVA. Um, one thing that Dina pointed out was that we have a list of what we call get-aheads uh, that can get added on or moved into the timeline depending on, on how well the crew is doing. And um, the, in order to install the IROSAs next summer, the main thing we have to do is put the platform in place and have it rigidized and, and fully bolted down. Um, but what we hope to do to get ready for those EVAs is route uh, the cables that go along with that. Um, you may have noticed in the video that we plan to pre-incorporate the One Alpha um, cables as part of our, our setup and, and translation. So they'll be at the work site, and our goal is to get them, them out and routed where they need to go. But if we have sufficient time and the crew is doing well, and our suits are performing well, um, we have permission from the ISS program to run a little bit long in order to install the 1B IROSA cable. So our goal in order to get as much done in preparation for the IROSA EVAs as possible is we're looking forward to um, doing that particular get ahead. And if we have permission, things work out in, in that plan, we may not get around to the S6 DDCU uh, jumper cable. So we have worked on various plans and the crew is aware. Um, they also have the ability to tell us if they don't want to go do that, if they're not feeling up to staying out there that long to do the EVA. So we um, set it up so that we are in a good position if we're available to get that done and it's very helpful, but we recognize that working in a spacesuit for that long is very exhausting and this is their first time, so we want them to know and to be as comfortable as possible to be able to, to handle what we, we set out for them to do. Um, so with that, like I said, it's a, it's a six and a half hour EVA nominally with the potential to run to seven hours. Um, given that particular condition. Um, so we, uh, we look forward to getting the crew out the door on Friday, and um, that's all I have to say about that. All right, appreciate it, Keith. And to Dina and Chloe as well, thank you all for those opening remarks. We're not gonna open it up for questions. So as a reminder, uh, if you're on the phone, please press star one to submit a question and enter into our queue. Once your name is called, please state uh, to whom you'd like to direct your question. And if you find your question has already been answered, then you can uh, press star two at any time to withdraw it. But uh, let's go ahead and get started here in the room. Gina, why don't you help us kick Gina it off? Gina Sinceri, ABC News. This is for Dina. Um, it seems like you have a bit of a spacesuit uh, issue up there. I know they're mix and match, but are your four, if you have two spacesuits possible, I think the third is working again. Um, does the crew have to be a similar size to mix and match and use those? I mean, how much an issue is the spacesuit shortage up there, or am I wrong in thinking there's a shortage? Well, you know, we always like to have redundancy, and so we, we had gotten down to two spacesuits, so we were, um, you know, I, I say, um, not we weren't in a good posture. So if we were to have a, a, an issue on that the day of the event, then it could, you know, could mean postponement of a of a spacewalk. Um, we have we do have um, sizes suit sizes, but we kind of take a size uh, like it's called a hard upper hard upper torso. And so, you know, for example, a medium or a large, you might be able to switch that out. And so when I say spacesuit, I guess I'm really talking about the life support system um, itself, um, but we have, um, you know, the ability to change the size of that one. So we do mix and match, um, and it's not as much a sizing issue as it is just trying to make sure that the main components, the life support system, um, that we have enough of those on board. Uh, and, you know, we can change components out. Um, so inside the spacesuit, I mentioned we have a fan pump separator, but we have other components as well. So if something fails in the suit, and we have that ability to also um, change those components out. Uh, I think it's just coincidence. Um, you know, the Orlans had um, some components that had gone out of life, uh, and then we've had a couple of um, problems as well. Um, so I wouldn't say, um, you know, it's more of a string of events um, that have occurred. So it, it just sounds like we've had, a, um, you know, multiple, multiple issues. But 
uh, I would say that we're, we're still in a good posture. And in fact, uh, my point I was trying to bring up was that we, we now have, we're up to three spacesuits, so we have uh, a third one to make us more redundant, and then we'll get a fourth on SpaceX 27, so on, on the U.S. side. And then on the Russians, on the Russian side, like I said, they brought theirs back up to um, working order again. Uh, and of course, they, they continually um, bring up spares and change out components as well. So I wouldn't really say we're in a, um, it, we're, overly concerned, but it, we were in a posture where we didn't have as much redundancy as we'd like. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Keith? No, uh, I, I think um, we address when the crews get assigned what the availability is for the suits. And so I think the ISS program helps us out in understanding what the logistics are for suits and what hardware goes up. So um, I think Dina explained it very well. Uh, she used to be an EVA officer like me long ago, so uh, she, she understands that aspect of the job very closely, but I think that's a good answer. Wonderful, thank you for the question. Let's head over to the uh, phone real quick, uh, Bill Harwood. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure who this is for, but uh, I wanted to ask a question about the micrometeoroid environment. You know, the Soyuz gets hit, and it automatically makes me think, and it always does for spacewalks, what happens if a crew member ever got struck by a particle like that? Can one of you review for us what how that would actually work, assuming that the astronaut's not incapacitated? How, how would the spacesuit work with a small puncture to get back to an airlock and you know, the contingency planning you guys put into all that. I just I just think that, you know, given the hit on the Soyuz, that's a relevant question. Thanks. Well, I can start, but I, I can tell you it's going to work its way up the table here as, as we answer your questions. Um, as the EVA officer, um, I, that is something that I think very much about in preparation for any EVA is, you know, um, what it takes to keep the keep our crew members safe, what it takes to get them out the door, um, fully prepared for all the things that could go wrong. Uh, Chloe and I did a sim on Friday where we uh, went through various failure scenarios to get ready for what it takes to get the crew members back in a circumstance like this. Um, the suit is designed to, um, to accommodate I, I, that's probably not the right word for it, but um, certain size puncture holes um, and yet still keep the crew members alive. The life support system is designed to accept um, and then there's also protective outer layers um, that hopefully do what they can to prevent that from happening. But um, I agree with you that when um, the Soyuz took this micrometeoroid hit, um, I wanted to know if we could determine the size of that hit because um, a certain size hole again, can be accepted to the, to the crew and we'll get them back in. We'll get emergency messages on the suit and the first thing we do is to speak with the crew talk about what it takes to get them back in as quickly as possible, and we set up their translation paths and their tethering so that the route to get back in is the quickest possible. Um, and with all of that, um, we are monitoring their suit consumables and we monitor comm with the crew. So if something like that were to happen, we would find out right away and we would start them on the path back to the airlock. Um, I would note, I think we probably would all hear the message at the same time, and then Chloe and I would talk on the flight loop about what it would take to get them back. And then she would start getting the rest of the crew ready uh, to accept getting this crew member in and, and back to the site pressure as quickly as possible under that scenario. Yeah, I think Keith answered pretty much everything that I had written down. Um, but yeah, I'm, crew safety, we're going to be watching the messages. Uh, we'll see how the crew's feeling. We'll be monitoring the data in the suits itself. And from that, we can determine what the next plan is. Are we, are we cutting everything off right away? Or was it um, small enough such that we can take our time getting back and be very uh, deliberate about what we're doing? Um, again, we have two folks on the ground. We have a person called a ground IV, which is the person who is talking directly to our EV crew members. And we also have um, another Capcom on board who is talking to our folks inside of ISS. So we'd have both of them communicating along a, a good open communication between the EV crew member as well as the folks inside so we know what we need to do. We have flight surgeons on hand uh, should we need to set up any other type of um, discussions that may need to have some uh, privacy concerns. Um, but we will 
first and foremost, take care of that crew member with whatever happened. And like Keith said, you know, we had um, we had a critical failure in, in our suit during our sim on Friday, and we practiced it, and, and the team is, is well versed in those procedures and those flight rules and understanding where we need to go from there. Um, I do have other folks uh, in the room who I can communicate with who will be communicating up and out to people like Dina, um, Joel and Dana, and anybody else who needs that information to help with uh, any, any type of post-secure, post-crew knowing that the crew is safe um, plans from there on out. So yeah, the only thing to add that. Okay, I guess the only thing I would add was just that, um, you know, we, we could talk about micrometeorites and we could talk about orbital debris. Um, and for micrometeorites, you know, we, we know when meteor showers are happening each year. Um, and so what are the actual dates? So we have a mitigation there where um, typically the, it does not raise it up to a very high level of concern, but, it, you know, if you know that you're going to have a very, um, like a peak of a meteor shower at the exact moment you're doing an EVA, you could um, reconsider, you know, you can consider changing the, the, the time or the date. Um, and then also for orbital debris, of course, um, we're tracking orbital debris of, of a certain size and larger, and we can move the station out of the way um, with the crew um, in advance of the spacewalk when we see that coming. So, um, but I think that this team has described very well uh, what we might do during a, a spacewalk for such an event. Wonderful. Thank you for the question, Bill. Um, that's it for the reporters in the queue. So just as a reminder, please uh, press star one to enter into the queue and ask a question. I have one I wanted to throw out there just to give reporters time, uh, just in case there's any uh, last questions. Uh, but I did want to throw this one out to uh, Chloe. Um, this is not the first time that we've insta installed this uh, mounting hardware on the International Space Station. We've had um, this this type of EVA before. What are some of the lessons learned from those previous a EVAs that are being applied to this one to ensure that it's the most successful? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a good question. Um, this is not the first time we've done this. This is actually the sixth mod kit that we've done. And I'll say, it, you know, you learn something new on, on every type of EVA. But I think one of the, the biggest things that we incorporate actually into the, the one Bravo, which is the last time that we did a mod kit, um, was being very deliberate in understanding how we monitor the number of turns on the bolts. Um, the bolts on the mod kit are very uh, sensitive and we have to be very diligent in understanding how many times have these bolts been turned to make sure that they are secure and that we don't have any type of structure concerns. So I would say what we've done um, is just understanding how we monitor the bolt turns, how we pass that along, how we're very efficient in understanding where we're at and knowing that we are in a safe config to continue to press on to the next one. So that's one thing that got incorporated last time and we're going to do that again this time and it's going to be a very, very effective uh, way of communicating and proceeding along with the timeline to keep ourselves moving. Excellent. Thank you, Chloe. That did spark some reporters to jump into the queue. So let's go to David Kelly uh, with Discovery. David Curley from Discovery. Thank you. Uh, it's kind of a follow on to that. Uh, this has been a, a process. It's uh, several spacewalks. What have you learned about the technology of rolling out um, these solar arrays? And have you come to the conclusion that this is the way to use solar arrays in the future? Well, I guess I'll, I'll take, oh, I'll just say, um, first of all, I, I think that the hardware has been extremely impressive. And I, I, I try to um, also uh, harp on that a little at the beginning, but uh, when you see the, when you see the rays unfurl uh, and they seem to do so perfectly um, and then um, provide power right away, uh, it's really impressive. So I'd say that really this is proving this is a good technology. Um, they're lightweight and flexible, easy to, um, easy to launch. Um, and I, I do think this is a really good methodology uh, and we are planning to use it in the future. Um, there's, there are other types of arrays that other vehicles also use. So I, I don't want to say that those other arrays are, are not adequate for their function and use either. Um, just that I will, uh, I will say that this particular technology has been, uh, is proving to be a good technology for us. Well, I'd, I'd like to add to that. When we installed the, the first set of IROSAs, um, the, the power generation of what about just over a third of the original, maybe, maybe a little over a third of the original legacy solar array was contained within that IROSA. So the power generation we need we need that step forward in technology and the capability to, to generate power. So it's, it's always the right direction to, to be able to update 
and accommodate higher power capacity, higher, higher storage uh, for all the use that we want to get out of station. So it's, um, I, I think that the technology is moving in the right direction and we're able to use it and that's thanks to the ISS program for, for pushing forward with that and getting it done. All right, thank you, David, for the question. Let's go back to uh, Bill Harward on the phone. Yeah, hey, thanks a lot. Uh, just two quick follow-ups on the on the whole impact sort of scenarios. Um, Dina, obviously, you know, you can move out of the way when you see something coming, but there's, you know, tens of thousands of things that are too small to track, and, you know, micrometeoroids you can't track at all. So one question I had was, was how do you even assess that environment from a safety standpoint? I mean, I don't know even how you would do a probabilistic risk assessment since the numbers aren't known in a lot of cases. So I'm curious about how NASA views the risk of sending guys out in, a, in an EMU. Um, and, and the only other question I had was I remember back in the shuttle days, they used to tell us that, you know, the suits had a 30-minute emergency supply of air that if something happened, you could rely on and get back to an airlock within 30 minutes. Is that still the case? Is 30 minutes still the timeline to be back in the, the airlock. Thanks. And that's it for me. Thanks. Okay, let me address your probabilistic risk assessment. Um, we do that, actually, and um, we do have uh, experts that uh, understand the micrometeoroid uh, environment. Um, you know, all over station, you have pockmarks, and um, we have got impacts, and um, the, we have folks that really do study that and understand that environment uh, pretty well. Uh, and so, um, like I said, we, we're able to kind of look at, the, from a meteorite standpoint, at least when the meteor showers are, could happen, but we have all these mitigations in place, training of the crew, understanding, you know, putting the tethers in a certain configuration for rapid, um, bringing the crew in. We have all those mitigations in place, again, but for the reasons you state, Bill, which are, you know, just that there is some, some uncertainty involved, and then we can't track everything. So, but we do the best we can, um, and I will say that, um, as I said, our experts uh, do give us probabilistic risk numbers, um, the probability of impact on a, on a particular day um, and a probability of catastrophic impact. Um, so we, we do have those discussions um, based on the, the, the environment's knowledge that we have and the models that we have. So, and then relative to the 30-minute ingress, you know, again, this is the way we try to plan our spacewalks. Um, sometimes we end up, like with the IROSA EVAs, particularly in December, we had to take a look at it. It could take us longer, actually, to bring the crew in greater than 30 minutes. Um, the 30 minutes is, is a rule, um, like a guideline, um, and it really it's dependent on the hole size and it's dependent on how much uh, oxygen you're actually losing, how much oxygen you already had in your tank when it happened. So there's a lot of those, a lot of those um, factors that would go into your actual time that you have available in such a case. So again, 30 minutes is a rule, but um, then we uh, assess it every single spacewalk and say, can we make it in 30? And if we can't, um, is it, I'd say, um, you know, should we eat into the margin um, in order to accomplish that task or not? So uh, we do look at that every flight. Do you have anything to add? Oh, I was just going to say that when, when this particular spacesuit was designed, um, part of the design process and, and the constraints were what kind of margin do you design into something like this and how do you accommodate for all the different failure modes that could happen on a spacesuit. And for that reason, that 30 minutes that, that you quote uh, is based on a particular size hole in the suit. So there's really no way to know that the hole would be smaller or larger than that. Um, it is just something that someone said as a requirement, here's what we're going to build towards. Um, the 30 minutes is actually interesting because the space station is so, so large that when you are all the way out at the extreme, the way we will be on the CBA, um, we do very carefully think about what it takes and everything it, it, that has to happen to get back inside in t on time under that, that 30 minutes or, or rough estimates of, of what it takes to get back. So um, again, a lot of planning and preparation. We let the crew know. We talk through emergency scenarios with them. Um, and it's, we get everybody ready to go, but there is always risk. And it's just like any time you get in an automobile, there is always risk. But um, we need to be willing to figure out the safest way to do it, get ready for all that could go wrong, and that's how we do it to put our, to put our crew members in that position.
Very good. Thank you for the question, Bill. And uh, that'll do it for the uh, phone queue. Uh, so we'll go ahead and wrap up our briefing for today. So thanks to all who submitted questions, who asked questions. And of course, thanks to our briefers for taking the time to discuss the upcoming spacewalk. Uh, for Friday, NASA TV coverage begins at 7 a.m. Eastern Time, 6 a.m. Central Time. The planned start time for that spacewalk is 8.15 a.m. Eastern, 7.15 a.m. Central. Thanks again for joining us. That will wrap up today's briefing.